Hi, and welcome to Mental Health Mondays with Dr. David Morgan. If this is your first time, welcome. If you are a regular viewer, welcome back. Um, thanks to Onward Productions, Shane and Mandy, for giving me this opportunity to talk about issues related to uh, mental health and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. If you know, this, this is actually the 38th episode we've done, and um, I love talking love talking about it. I don't think I've run out of opinions yet. I probably will never run out of opinions, um, And uh, but I'm just very grateful to have this opportunity. What I really need are your questions. That's what I love to do is answer viewer questions uh, about issues related to mental health and the gospel. Uh, if you have a question, here's how you can reach out to me, onward.mental.health.mondays at gmail.com. And I'll do my best to, uh, to get to your question and to answer it. So let's talk about a viewer question today. And this viewer asks, how do you forgive someone who suffers from mental illness and doesn't feel that they've wronged you? So there's kind of two parts to this question. First is, um, what is the kind of relationship between accountability and mental illness? Are mental health are 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 people who have mental illness accountable for their behavior? And then a separate issue regarding um, forgiveness and when or when um, not should we engage in forgiveness? So let's talk about accountability issue first. Um, it really depends, in my opinion, it really depends on the seriousness of the condition. I have, uh, of the mental health condition, I have dealt with people in my career who have very, very serious mental illness, people with extreme delusions and powerful hallucinations to where their perception of reality is almost 100% altered. Um, they, they don't see the things that we see, they don't experience the things that we experience. And so their reactions to what they perceive is actually a pretty decent reaction. It's just that their perceptions are completely distorted. So I would say a person in that situation is probably has very little accountability for what they're doing because they just aren't getting an accurate input um, to act upon. Um, but then I guess you could say that all of mental illness is kind of this distorted reality field, just to one degree or another. Um, anytime we have uh, mental health conditions, usually it's the product of distorted thoughts. And the more our thoughts are distorted, the more distorted our perception of things is going to be. So as we decrease the distortion in thoughts, we tend to decrease the effect of mental health conditions. Um, so the question is just how much reality distortion is going on. If you say a person has like a minor mental illness, that could be a minor reality distortion. So are they mostly accountable for their behavior? Um, and I, I think it's just, it's a hard question to answer because you really don't know just how distorted someone's perception is. I mean, in the example I provided earlier with, uh, I was describing someone with schizophrenia, you could say, well, clearly they have a, a very distorted reality field. What about personality disorders? Um, probably pretty distorted there, but then there's also the element that there might be some accountab accountability there as well. What about depression or anxiety? Um, how much of these things, how much do these things affect our ability to make good choices? Uh, you could use a common example and talk about, um, let's say you, you leave your phone on the ground and a toddler comes up and steps on your phone and breaks it. Well, you're probably not going to be very angry at the toddler because you're going to think, you know, it wasn't her fault and um, she doesn't know what she's doing. Now, if an adult comes up and looks at your phone on the ground and intentionally steps on it to break it, you might think, wow, that's that deserves a little more accountability and maybe I should be a little more angry at that person and withhold forgiveness, especially if they're not repentant. If they say, I don't care that I broke your phone. In fact, I meant to break your phone because I don't like you as a person. What do you do in that case? Do you forgive? Do you say, well, if, if I forgive, does that let them off the hook? Um, that's kind of the, sometimes that is one of the things that we worry about when it comes to forgiveness is we think if I forgive them, then that makes them like less accountable. That makes them so that they don't have to be responsible for what they've done. I think we need to divorce those two things because accountability comes from our father in heaven. He is going to hold us accountable for all the things we do, for the things we haven't repented of, and he will do it with perfect justice and mercy. We don't have to get into the business of holding people accountable um, in, in that kind of eternal scheme of things. And we'll talk about that a little more um, later. So 
when you have someone who has done something to wrong you, whether they have mental illness or not, whatever degree of accountability you think they have, what do you do? Do you forgive or not? Well, the Lord has asked us to forgive each other, and, and it's clear throughout Scripture. And um, sometimes we are tempted to withhold that forgiveness because we, like I said before, we we feel like if we if we forgive in a situation where the person is not repentant, then somehow we've done something wrong. Well, actually, it's the opposite. Um, our job is to forgive people because holding on to hate or anger or resentment is corrosive. There's a great example in the Book of Mormon where um, Nephi and his brothers go back to Jerusalem the second time to get uh, Ishmael and his family so that the boys can have um, women in their lives to, to marry and have families. Well, on their way back, Laman and Lemuel start another stink and they say, let's go back to Jerusalem. We're done with this and, and we're going to go live there. Well, Nephi really kind of calls them out right in front of their um, their women folk, their new girlfriends, and Laman and Lemuel are not happy about this. So they tie up Nephi and leave him for dead in the desert. Nephi prays and receives um, strength. The Lord looses his bands and Laman and Lemuel are about to do something else again, but then the daughters of Ishmael intervene and they beg Laman and Lemuel not to harm Nephi. Uh, Laman and Lemuel have this incredible change of heart. They beg Nephi for his forgiveness. And so what does Nephi do? I think Laman and Lemuel had some accountability here. They knew what they were doing. Um, probably a certain distorted reality field just because of you know their lack of spirituality. But what did Nephi do? First Nephi 7.21, and it came to pass that I did frankly forgive them all that they had done, and I did exhort them that they would pray unto the Lord their God for forgiveness. Nephi understood that forgiveness was not for Laman and Lemuel. Forgiveness was for him. The Lord's going to deal with Laman and Lemuel. I imagine they'll find a fair degree of, uh, of compassion and understanding. But um, in order for Nephi to move forward, he had to forgive Peter uh, kind of once famously asked the Savior, how many times do I have to give, forgive my brother? Up until seven? And you remember what the Savior answered. He said, "He said you have to forgive up until 70 times seven. I think what the Savior was trying to say is, again, teaching that point, Peter, forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is for you. Uh, it's almost like Peter was asking, how many times do I have to refuse to drink the poison? Seven times? Um, on that eighth time they offer me the poison, can I drink it then? Is that okay? Well, we think we think about that and you think that's absurd. Why would you drink poison at any time, even if it was offered to you seven times, eight times, or 490 times, seven times seven? You never want to drink the poison. That's what the Savior was trying to teach. And when we view forgiveness as that antidote, then of course we want to do it. The Lord has commanded us to forgive. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 64, verses 9 through 11. Wherefore, I say unto you that ye ought to forgive one another. For he that forgiveth not his brother his trespasses standeth, standeth condemned before the Lord. For there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive. But of you it is required to forgive all men. And ye ought to say in your hearts, let God judge between me and thee and reward thee according to thy deeds. But of you, it is required to forgive all men. The person that doesn't forgive, for there remaineth in him the greater sin. Again, I think what the Lord is trying to teach is forgiveness is for us. Forgiveness helps us move forward. Forgiveness gives us peace. Refusing to forgive really doesn't, doesn't do anything to the other person, hardly. All it does is hurt you. Uh, I think the sooner we understand that, then the more this issue of should I forgive or should I not forgive just becomes more clear and and we just we lean towards forgiveness the whole time. Now, this doesn't mean that everything is forgotten and it doesn't mean if there's a situation where you've been the victim of abuse, it doesn't mean you run back into that situation or if you have been um wronged out of a bunch of money or something like that, that you go back to invest with this person, there are going to be some consequences. Friendships might be muted or or something like that in the future. Um, but that's different than forgiveness. Forgiveness is where you say in your heart, I forgive you for what you have done. That doesn't mean that I'm going to start living with you again, or that doesn't mean that we're going to enter into another business venture again, but I forgive you for what you have done. That brings the peace. That brings that peace and kind of uh, clarity of conscience that we really need in order to become more like the Savior. So getting back to that question of 
how do you forgive someone who has wronged you, especially if it's a question of mental illness? You just have to forgive. Um, and I'm not suggesting that it's easy. I'm just saying it's as simple as that. It's just a one-step process. We need to learn to forgive. If we don't feel strong enough to forgive, then we pray for the strength to forgive. If you don't want to forgive, then pray for the desire to forgive. Start somewhere. Ask your Heavenly Father. Your Savior knows how to forgive. He has the desire to forgive, and He can share that desire and that knowledge with you if you ask Him. So thanks again for everyone for your questions. I hope this was helpful. If you have any other questions for me, you can uh, reach me at the email I showed at the beginning or on my Instagram at LDS Psychologist or on my website at www.ldspsychologist.com. And always remember that change is possible, but that change requires action and to keep moving forward. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.